Chris, welcome back to Architect Tomorrow. Thank um, you. It's great to have you back. It's uh, we were just sort of chatting before we hit the the record button. How um, you know things have changed quite a lot in the last two years. So we'll probably touch on on, on some of that. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, for those that haven't checked out the previous uh, recording where Chris talked about his journey, career journey, particularly the journey to CISO, do go and check that one out. It's been one of our most popular videos on the channel, and so it's awesome to have you back to talk about the things that we didn't touch on. So that episode was actually pretty short. It was about 23, 24 minutes, so it's pretty short. Yeah. But I, I'm keen to catch up with you on where you are at the moment, your thoughts on your current thoughts on cybersecurity. I'm sure we'll touch on that. I know one of the things I'd love to talk to you about as well is the book. I know you're kind of looking at refreshing some of that at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and definitely a lot of the topics I think we'll touch on today are covered in your blog, right? Which is cybersecurity matters. And that's all one word dot blog so do go and check out yeah. chris's writing because there's some good there's some good stuff there so last time we were talking you were the CISO of Tanium. talk yeah. just a little bit about what's happened since then and where, where, where yeah. you're starting at the moment yeah no definitely hi everyone and what a great intro um you've basically shielded everything that i do so i don't have to like comment on anything great uh <laughs> i don't remember when we was it 2019 was our first it was, no 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 it wasn't that far long ago it was actually i checked when well, the episode went out in april 21 so i reckon we probably okay. recorded it in march from, so we're talking like mid-covid lockdowns all that cool, sort cool, of cool. stuff with i was i was basing it on hair length i was trying to work out when do you know what i mean i was like when did i have that haircut I moved across to a company called Contentful, so headless content management, um, like composable content. Great time there building out a security organization, so big up Contentful. Um, I kind of missed the cyberspace, like genuinely, like it's almost gone full circle. I spent so much time at Tanium and Zscaler um, working directly in the industry, if it was with analysts, if it was with customers, if it was building products, whatever. And I spent probably a good sort of five, six, seven, I'm useless with, with, with time probably six years doing that. And I thought, right, I want a fresh break to kind of get out of the cyber world for a bit, still be a CISO, still build a security org, but, you know, not have the, the externally facing side of it. But I didn't last very long. Like I genuinely missed having that ability to say what I think, quite frankly, and to help kind of shape direction and, and shape the yeah. industry. What I didn't want to do was just go and join a, another cyber company. And right. that's not mention any, but do you know what I mean? Like if you're going to yeah. talk as a voice, I don't, I'm trying not to say evangelist, but if you're going to talk about, you know, things that you're passionate about, make sure that the company kind of aligns both culturally and technologically <laughs> with what that is, right? So um, very long way of, of introducing Cyberhaven. But yeah, I've joined Cyberhaven, who are taking kind of data protection in an entirely new way of looking at it right so and again this is not now going to be a sales pitch but look at what happened as he goes into one well, well you know it's funny because actually i did promise you in the last episode you could have a whole episode dedicated to, to, to selling stuff and, yeah, uh, yeah. you did you did say that i'd be a terrible <laughs> seller but i will shut up in one second but like how like the av industry went from very kind of preventative very signature oriented hey this is what we do and we update that files and nothing works I know data protection has been like that. I think we've even talked about it professionally. Like, hey, how do we control data? Regex based shit doesn't work. Like, I, mean, I mean, yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think my big bug, in fact, I talked about this, I think, on Data Privacy Day and various things like that, right? Where the data classification thing is just so broken because no one does it, right? I mean, you, yeah. you open the document and it's unclassified or it's at the default classification level or someone's randomly picked a, uh, a classification they think it is, but they've not really thought about what the content 100%. of the document is. A hundred percent. And and they need to know, they kind of need to predefine kind of where it is and where it's going to and all these things that no team credibly can do. I mean, you and I have spoken before about this disconnect between the security function and the business data protection, like they need to be kind of, I mean, they should be anyway, but if you're going to rely exclusively on DLP, you need to be talking to the business every day on what's important and no one's doing that. But anyway, you don't want to hear me kind of talking about cyber haven, but that kind of way of working, shifting from a very preventative model to one much more around sort of detection and response, really understanding data flows and being able to create and educate users and their behaviors. So I got very kind of kind of Zscaler vibes. Do you know what I mean? I joined them very early on and they were doing a very new new thing with cloud security. And I've, I've kind of got the opportunity to do that in data. So yeah, buzzing, man. I've been there about a month now, I think. So it's good. Nice one. Well, awesome. It's, it's great to see you back in the security industry evangelizing because you're really, really good at getting on stage and, and getting people sort of, you know, to understand what's 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 really important in, in the space and actually on that i wanted to kind of talk to you a bit about you know it's it's a really weird time i think for tech you know um when we recorded our last episode 
our tech was probably one of the only industries, bizarrely, doing okay because uh, because of COVID, everyone was having to invest more in, in digital transformation and, and communications tools like the one we're recording this on. Um, but I think naturally that couldn't continue, like that continual investment and in hiring sort of, but these things are in cycle, right? And unfortunately, the, that was going to have to kind of course correct. So I think what we're seeing now yeah. to a degree is a bit of course correction. Um, but obviously, some companies being hit harder than others. But where do you think sort of, the world is in terms of kind of you know given given the financial pressures the economic headwinds the yeah. sort of fewer dollars that people have to spend on security tools what's what's your sort of take on what's you know and of course you're going to say probably going to say data protection no 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 but in the round like, you know, what, 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 where's, where's your head at the moment on what the CISO should sort of be prioritized that's a great question i said to someone recently it might be my ceo the CISOs today given like the macroeconomic climate and everything else yeah. you were talking about almost have to be like a mini CFO, right? Okay. Like you, you, you touched on kind of probably end of 2020, 2018 to 2020, where companies were just printing money almost and security budgets were kind of linear with that. And hey, you can have what you want. I don't think there's a CISO out there who hasn't had to have that conversation with their kind of leadership team of, do we really need insert tool here next year? So the ones that have taken a very kind of bottom-up approach to security are the ones that I think are, are kind of struggling now because you're starting, it's almost like Jeopardy. You're almost like reversing the process for justifying your thing, right? You bought it and your board or your CFO said, right, okay, well, Chris says he needs that thing. Fine, here's 300 grand. Now you're going in and they're saying, well, do we really need that? And I think people are struggling with the ones who have taken a very technical approach and said, right, how do I now justify a firewall or what is right. CSPM and why does my CFO care because ultimately the bluntest instrument you can use across a company is say right okay let's try and shave 12 percent off every business unit and i'm seeing that in a lot of places and if you're doing right. that how do you then count a fight it shouldn't be a fight it should be a cohesive working relationship but how how do you then and it never is how do you how do you do that right so a super long answer but i think i think that's where you know, the more experienced CISOs have done well, the ones with strategies, the ones with business plans who've gone in and said, this is the risk that these controls are mitigating. Do we still have that risk irrespective of the headwinds? The answer is yes, we need the control. Now, now it might be you get clever on where that control is applied mm. or the tech tool that you use for that control. There's a bunch of things we could go on to, including like the technical nature of the CISO role, which I'm keen to go in a minute. But the thing that's kind of sprung to mind there is to the degree to which you may be um, the, the, what, what the controls are, right? I mean, because you, yeah. you, talk, you talk there about the kind of taking a control and risk-based approach, which I don't, I, I, it's interesting hearing you talk because I think some people clearly want to just sort of tick every technical box. Oh, I'm, I'm more secure if I've got every single thing on the, you know, the Gartner is telling me I need in, in, yeah. in a security sense or, or an insert rubber analyst here. Um, but, but for me, that, well, we both know this, right? That you can employ other controls. It could be, there's a human, more of a human element to some of this risk management, right? And you take a different approach. But um, I think the layered sort of approach is, is interesting. But the point I wanted to get to was this technical approach is interesting, right? Because to the degree a CISO should be technical is, is an interesting sort of point I want to get on to. But what you've just described is where a CISO has looked at the world maybe entirely from a technical perspective and actually forgotten to kind of get their business stakeholder on board. Uh, and uh, yeah. Not all the business is going to care what all the different security technologies are, but they at least need to be aware of what the big sort of top five things are that are keeping the company secure, right? And so yeah. where is your head these days on how technical a CISO needs to be? Right, I'll, I'll answer that. I should probably also have finished answering your previous point. Like, If people actually want like like table stakes of what I think people need to do, it's really, really simple. And it hasn't, it hasn't changed irrespective of cloud native environments, right? You just okay. need to know. The assets that you care about, you need to know the data that's important. You need to know who's accessing them from where. And can you go back and look at all of that stuff? I mean, if you did nothing else, I know that sounds like a super Hodson approach to oversimplifying things, but like, that's it, isn't it, really? So but that's I mean, the foundation, in, isn't it? It's, it's, yeah, you, in can't, you can't manage what you can't measure, which is which means you know what your assets are. And that, and that includes data assets as much as it, I mean, it includes you know, technology. And, um, well, if you, and if you want to bring the business in, like data, and this isn't me selling again, but honestly, like data is a pretty solid place to start, like business impact analysis, right? Okay, what are your business services? Right, okay, what do they run on? Okay, what's being processed and stored? Well, it sits at anyway, the heart of, heart yeah, of everything. But, but, but your thoughts on sort of how technical a CISO needs to be in 2023? Um, 
and ostracize myself from the community very quickly. Um, I think I think incredibly technical, and I've just talked there about top down, but they're not mutually exclusive. Okay. Right. I was, I was going to come up with an analogy about hoodies and suits, but I won't. I won't well, your hoodie is particularly cool. So, um... I, you know what? There, there are two reasons I'm wearing this hoodie. Set. I'm going to America tomorrow, and most I'm going for quite a long time. So, like, all of my clothes are packed, and I was like, well, what am I going to wear for this? So, my daughter thought it would be a good idea. Oh, it's cool. Um, I love it. Oh, thank you. Uh, how technical do I think it's true? Pretty technical. Like, if you're going to, like I said, they can't be mutually exclusive or they shouldn't. Just because you can talk in a boardroom and you can have a top down message that hopefully resonates doesn't mean that you shouldn't understand how your microservices are running in Kubernetes. Like that's my my view. Now, lots of people disagree with that and say that, no, I'm a CISO, but I have teams of people who understand tech stacks in GCP and whatnot. Yep. But like back to that conversation, I'm justifying technical tooling. I just don't see how a CISO can, can do that if they're not technically. Impaired. And also it's such a stressful job that if you don't love the tech, then like why are you doing it? Like I don't. Do you know what I mean? Like you have. You got to have a pa- you got to have a passion for it to a degree. Yeah. I guess it's. A, and I suppose like I have this classic axes that anyone who is coached or mentored by, by me will probably recognise as such. Talk about it, but it's like so the degree which you're business facing, like or business focused versus technical focused, and then to the degree to which you're sort of project um, focused on the one hand, or like strategy and um, architecture focused, perhaps on the, on the other yeah. angle. And yeah, that's good. Um, I, I, and clearly, you can be a very business fo- CISO. You could be a very perhaps project focused CISO, like kind of implementing new initiatives, new controls, or you could kind of perhaps look at the kind of wider strategy and, and the broad. So, so I guess there are many ways of kind of executing the CISO role. But okay. it does feel it does feel like being a technology generalist and being a good communicator are like minimum bits. Yeah. But it feels like you can knock it out of the park if you've got those things and you've got some depth in say. Some of the things you were talking about, maybe cloud native, maybe yeah. um, you know, e- 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 email or, or whatever it is. You know, there's there's some sort of angle that you kind of bring to the table, if nothing else, so that you can have that conversation with security engineers and IT engineers in a credible way to say, hey, you know, I, I maybe don't understand the full detail of what you guys are doing, but I can at least speak some of your language, and therefore you don't think I'm just some propeller head. Yeah, that, you've absolutely smashed it. That that side of it is critically important. Right, is the going to I don't know an SRE team we're building everything in Terraform and you might not be able to sit there and build your own Terraform files. And so yeah. I'll ask, um, but at least understanding what they do as a day job, you know, decompose. I talked earlier about business impact analysis. That's essentially what you're doing, but you're doing it with an engineer rather than a head of department and say, right, what do you do day to day? Okay. Why? The why very rarely gets asked, right? I think we're guilty in the security world of like reading a standard and saying like almost dogmatically, you should do this. Mm. When you're not doing that, we then raise you a defect for you to go and fix this thing. But why don't we sit down and say, well, well, why are you doing it that way? Because very few people are actually overtly malicious or lazy. Like, do you know what I mean? And I think we take this view that everyone is. And and I think if we just had better communication, we'd be in a much better place, man. I mean, yeah, basically trying not to be the department of no. Um, Yeah. But, and, I'm, and I'm being the department of no because I just want you to implement, um, you know, what comes out of the. And I'm looking at the book on the shelf, the CSSP right manual. Right, I'm just going to dogmatically apply everything yeah. that tells me to do. And if you if you're coming to me with a project or an initiative that's going to like deviate from that, I'm just going to say no because I had these cl- I've had these classic arguments in the past with someone who doesn't get um, the technology and they're trying to apply old school sort of thinking to securing that. And it's like, yeah, but understand yeah. what it is that you know understand how that and it, you've touched on this already right cloud native is a is the biggest example and the last couple of episodes actually it'll probably be before when this one comes out have been okay. talking about that shift in mindset you need to take when it comes to cloud and i think the same is true of security it, it, as technology moves you need to kind of move and shift be prepared to move and shift your mindset and 100%. your point about dogmatically saying right now you need to sort of follow this sort of standard uh is 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 a dangerous position to be in it's pragmatism i think is it's all about trade-offs isn't it it is and and i don't want to like confuse or contradict or conflate here but like earlier when i said oh it's these principles you know you should know where your assets are you know where your data is absolutely but how you practically apply because it's all about sound very like sales again but it is all about visibility and control isn't it ultimately like that's all the security function you should really care about so you have those principles Cloud Native massively moves the goalposts in terms of how you like aggregate or assimilate the data you need, both technically, but also from a process perspective. So I think we labor the points of service meshes and Kubernetes, and I'm guilty of doing that. But it's the way, it's the hearts and minds, isn't it? It's the way engineers 
are working. Like I remember my days back at a payment provider where you would create like very detailed design documentation, not just me, anyone in like Eng or Infra, same with banking, same in financial services, 50, 60, 70 page documents, right? And then from there, we'd almost create an equally verbose security guide that would go with it that very few people, if anyone would ever read, but it kept people in work. You're lucky now in some cases for like a prototype or a release drop, like a point release of a product to get a page in GitHub. Like, do you know what I mean? And from, and from there, you're like, right, how? Given that that culturally is how we work and we iterate and it's it's not a yeah. wrong thing, it's not a right thing, it's just a new way of doing it. How does security kind of inject itself appropriately in that? And I think that is the biggest shift. Uh, of course, if I was yeah. going to throw a buzzword at this point in time, I'd say DevSecOps, right? Integrating security yeah. into the pipeline, into that tool chain and, and, and crucially culture though, right? I mean, as much as it's, about systems it's also about culturally kind of definitely being the but i i think another interesting angle i know we've sort of we were planning for this when it when we talk about being technical we don't always have to necessarily mean about information technology i think being technical yeah. can equally understanding regulations and privacy standards and law right i think that you know because the word technical can mean sort of, sort of technicalities right and, and yeah true. so so what's your sort of take on the sort of privacy and regulatory sort of uh, field i mean because it, it's just growing right i mean it seems like every week there is a new reg or a new standard and yeah. it's quite bewildering right with the digital um the new digital acts and stuff protection acts and safety bills and things that are out there there's the telco security regulation if anyone's in that sort of space but yeah. but yeah where's your sort of um head at the moment on the sort of privacy and regulatory space um it's a headache like genuinely i mean you, you understand why it's necessary like some fundamental change in some of the industries you talked about but Again, I think roles and responsibilities without Teflon shouldering this like, are critically important for the CISO and the security function. So I've always worked very closely with kind of internal and external legal counsel right. in companies. I mean, honestly, if you think, especially when you're like presenting to audit committees and boards and whatnot, if you're like in step with legal and privacy, which are, it's probably another podcast on where privacy sits, but right. somewhere in the Venn diagram of the conversation yep. we're having, right? That's critically important because your team, I mean, <laughs> I won't go off, off, off some scenarios or experience here, but trying to get somebody who's a security engineer to go and research the specific control clauses of a new law and interpret it what best of breed means. I mean, I am harking now back to GDPR, but it's just such right. a good example, right? right? Or appropriate or, you know, defense in depth. Like they're not in the literal sense, qualified to, to, to kind of make a make a call on that. So legal are, generally speaking, and the, the biggest challenge I have is it's all based on experience, isn't it? So no mm. one knows until something's challenged or tested in a court or other means, but generally through, through a process, you don't know if that level of encryption or retaining that particular data element or obfuscating in this fashion, because they're all written as laws, like at a very high level, it's tricky, right? So security teams naturally don't really want to get involved. I think I think we generally like things to be pretty on or off. Right. I don't know if that's fair. I'm literally thinking this off the top of my head, but like no, that's... No, I, 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 think? Think I'm, I think I'm with you. I think it's quite a rare breed who has the technical, going back to our previous... Yeah, yeah, yeah. ...and understand regular... And I, I guess that's partly why... Uh, I, I've, I've been exposed to a bit of that from my big four days and, and, and working in financial services where it's a highly regulated environment. And you're just yeah. forced to go through various compliance training and things like that. But I don't think your average technologist or your average sort of security person has necessarily had that exposure uh, or inter to your point, in interest. It's just not what makes them tick, right? They're passionate about tech. They're not passionate about legal frameworks. and no. So it's, I guess it's it's that kind of knowing enough to kind of get, and I think this is what's missing, right? I see a lot of people that just don't care about it whatsoever. They're just yeah. head down in, and we touched on this actually in the last video. We talked about how to be good at your role. You need to at least understand, empathize, and interface well with your stakeholder group. Yeah. Um, and this is where I feel people go wrong. I feel like they get very siloed. They get they very do. specialized. They're amazing at like cloud native security or, you know, pipelines or whatever it might, Kubernetes, whatever it might be. But you come to them and say, yeah, so what are the things that, you know, you need to be thinking about from a reg perspective or a legal perspective when it comes to this tech? And they, most of them would probably look at you like you had landed from Mars and ask them a Martian question. So 
that that for real feel, feels like a gap. But it's tricky. And I, as much as we talk about a, secu- a, a security talent shortage, I feel like there is a shortage of people in the in that sort of interfacing layer, like data protection people, um, you know, privacy and reg sort of people. I, I, I see that as a, as much of a gap, in, in all honesty, as, as much as sort of deep technical skills. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and just to kind of support that, I think something that's missing, there's lots of toolkits for technical stuff. And right. even for like more familiar regulatory compliance, so, you know, the ISO 2701s, yep. the you know, Cloud Security Alliance, CCM stuff, like there's, there's templates you can go out and go, yes, no, yes, no. And it puts out uh, the open sounds brilliant for that, by the way. Um, but when it comes, because again, they're subjective and they need to be qualified in a, in a law, in a law, in a court, you don't get those on the privacy side. So, I mean, the only actionable piece of advice I could give today is like, rather than have individual cases where you have engineers having to interpret privacy requirements, privacy, sorry, try and um, try and have them in some form of standard, like at least have something internally that says, hey, when you're doing a thing, consider this encryption or this role-based access control or use this library for obfuscation. Now, at that point, the technical person, technical, technical, not legal, te- technical, technical, doesn't <laughs> then understand the nuance of control clause 4C. They just do a thing, but they can learn more about it if they want. So having that, I don't know what it would be, like a like almost compendium of information, like something they can go to and grab and, mm. and do it. I'm waffling now, but that... No, no, that... no, I, no I, I don't think you are. And actually, I think you're touching on one of my uh, pet topics, which is knowledge management, right? Yeah. And having, having sort of a decent taxonomy of patterns, of standards, of principles. Uh, it's, I think people, a lot of people skim over it because I think, oh, that's just sort of, I don't know, red tape bureaucracy. Actually, a lot of this architectural guide rail stuff is pretty helpful. Um, anyway, go, going back to sort of, we touched on DevSecOps and Agile. Um, everyone talks about shifting security left. Right, it just feels like a phrase that people say, but they don't really understand what they're talking about. Yeah. What, what what does that mean to you, and how do you actually how do you actually shift security there? It's a great question. I think I think you kind of summarised it. We both summarised it. The conversation thus far, in all seriousness, like giving actionable sort of iterative security consultancy. Right, like look at, and this actually continues on nicely from that previous question. In the, yeah. you know, look at look at how we used to resource security teams as well. So I talked about creating these monolithic documents. But we used to have lots of people doing that at the same time. So security almost scaled horizontally with other functions, right? Well, you can't you can't do that when people are spinning up prototypes and you know they're branching code and they might be working on seven different copies of something. Like, how are you possibly going to go to your you know CFO or CEO and say, hey, by the way, can I have seven security engineers because we've got seven engineers? You're going to get sacked, aren't you? So yeah. you need what's the question? Shifting security left. So like. To be able to do that, you need to do two things, right? And this is like all my secrets here. Like you need to you need to try and get to a point where like devs and SREs are self-sufficient, right? Like not entirely self-sufficient. Um, I was almost was going to draw parallels with children, but that would work terribly because they're not children. But you know what I mean? In the sense of you would instruct someone for experience and you'd provide guardrails. So you would say, right, if there's something very specific or particular security consideration you haven't seen before. Let's walk through a threat model. Let's build something repeatable so right. you can come and, and, and do it. But broadly, setting out a set of standards, assessing a level of maturity for security in that organization, by that I mean the, the end side of it, is like critically important rather than having somebody just immersed in their one-to-one. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I think what you're just describing is governance, right? And again, it's yeah, one of these words that I think a lot of people switch off on because they hear it and they think it's going to be boring. And yeah, so it's it's probably not the most sexy and exciting thing we do in our jobs, but it's actually really, really important. Um, Massively so. If you don't, cool. like, if you don't, yeah, if you don't have, because there was another part to that as well, sorry. You have obviously that governance side of it, but the other one, and this is where I think the role of the security engineer is changing, you have automation as well. And I know we talk to death about like automation and how it's going to save the world and like people being stressed and don't worry because we're going to automate everything. But in terms of, things like code review or like dynamic testing of a web app or looking for secrets in code, whatever it is, there's a triage level that can be done in an automated fashion, right? Yes, there needs to be work of how you integrate those tools into pipelines, but doing that takes a ton of heat off the security function. So long as you have people trained back to the self-sufficiency thing, on how to look at the results of those tools, because there's nothing worse than paying hundreds of thousands of dollars of tools 
and then them just being flashing lights that that no one um no one looks at really so staying on this uh, topic actually for a bit longer I'm going to throw something here, a bit of a curveball at you. I'll be interested to see how you respond. So right now, the world is going crazy for the GPT family of technologies. I, yeah. I thought the GPT family of technologies, because I've been looking at this from, since way before chat yep. GPT has, has been a big thing in the news. But like, clearly, everyone is looking at how does this impact them. But what you've just described, it does make me wonder whether tools like GPT that can generate code, but can also explain code, could be quite helpful for the security function, right? Could do you see a future where the security function is using these things to kind of augment their understanding and intelligence of the, the threat models of a piece of code or, or, or an application? You know, so, where, where's your head on the sort of AI augmentation for security analysts? Uh, great question. It certainly has a place. I think the security, so again, pre chat GPT, pre GPT, even like security's kind of been going down a model of kind of more ML, but, you know, of building out data sets and, and learning models so that we can identify malicious things before they're defined as malicious, blah. So I think this is somewhat of a continuation of that. And there's always the challenge of garbage in, garbage out, right? Like we've seen a few things this week where, you know, certain responses to certain questions were possibly wrong, given incorrect information being part of that like kind of learning pool or whatnot, or however it's constructed. But um has its place definitely um creating code yep again could could do it for certain tasks but um yeah it's just a continuation of of kind of how we learn how we develop so yeah absolutely like writing code will, do i think it will be able to replace all forms of kind of security engineering and testing no i mean think of how pen testing works today yes you have some of it which is run using technical tools but you know the real kind of tough to find difficult like logic within an application, um, that's been done by by humans. Short answers don't know, but I think I think it will have a place. Um, but it certainly won't. I've seen lots of things on Twitter saying, "Oh, the role of SecOps will no longer be a thing right. because we'll right. have ChatGPT that can ingest everything." I mean, it, I, I it, think people are overestimating the impact to replace people and underestimating the yeah. ability of it to augment people. Would be my yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and so, look, I'm really, I'm really keen to kind of get onto the topic of your book. Are you, are you kind of refreshing the book in light of some of the things we've just sort of talked about? The kind of you know, the the changes to the world since you wrote the first version. Could give us an idea of, of of what the version two is all about. Cheers, thanks. Um, yeah, it really is. Just like the first one was an opportunity just to kind of give a view of how I thought we weren't doing the fundamentals, and we talked about some of those fundamentals today. The new version, he says, having only written a bit of it. <laughs> is is much more around yeah how the world has changed both from uh how people are investing in security companies to uh, you know uh, a, a strong focus in some areas on web three to uh, you know this whole working from home on a kind of mass scale because when i wrote the first book i think it was 2018 2019 so i, I wrote most of it in 2018 um yeah. i mean the world technologically if nothing else before we talk about other things has changed so profoundly well cult culturally to, as well with hybrid working yeah. now being far more of a thing than 100%. it was that then um so so yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's much more about how things have have changed um i'm playing around with some points on data breaches at the moment because there's been since 2018 some fairly um sort of major supply chain based right. attacks shall we call them that, that possibly yeah. we haven't seen major instances of before that's not to hang anyone out to dry but you know just to give a view of how kind of the threat landscape, quote unquote, has changed. And then some more kind of recent, possibly slightly more philosophical subjects like the use of like password managers, their efficacy and are they solving problems? Are they causing problems? Stuff like that. That's what I told my editor anyway. So if you're listening, Nick, hi. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's... And, that's and remind, I remind the li listeners uh, what the book's called. It is called Cyber Risk Management. It has a okay. longer subtitle, but yeah, cyber risk management. Uh, okay. I enjoyed writing it. It did rather well. So if you bought it, thank you. Um, and yeah, I think the, I think the new release, I think I'm going to finish it by August. So I think it'll come out okay. end of the evening. So um, a nice Christmas present for the security. Nice Christmas present. In your life. I, need, I need to, yeah, I need to check the, uh, like the dates on that. But yeah, I think around Christmas, definitely. Nice one. And you, you touched on Web3. I know this is something that we, we don't always necessarily agree on. Agree you're on. pretty yeah, bullish yeah. on things like NFTs. And I'm a little bit like, mm, not so sure. So where where is your uh, where is your head on on NFTs and sort of crypto? Because obviously it's been through much like the tech sector has. It's been through a yeah. bit of a roller coaster. 
I think I might, rather than the strap line being Chris Hilton is bullish on NFTs, I, th- I think decentralization and kind of contemporary communities is, is something that I'm okay. much more kind of bullish on. Um, yeah, like everything else, it's gone through this period of peaks and troughs. I think certainly it's it's somewhat of a of a trough or a, or a bear market at the moment. But you know, creating ways, immutable ways, essentially, you know, to be able to kind of bring people together to evidence things, to build communities. I mean, that's been the thing that's blown me away the most. It's not the JPEG. I mean, t- let's take NFTs very specifically. Right. It's not the picture itself in, yeah. in most cases. It's either the community. It's being part of something. It's the subsequent utility and access that that may give you that I think has kind of galvanized a, a community. And I that's think. probably, I guess, what people overlook, right? They just see yeah. a pixelated JPEG or something and they think, what the yeah. hell is that? But actually, it's it's... I like to think of them as more like a digital loyalty card or a kind of, t- you know, kind of some kind of new model for, uh, yeah. So that kind of, the, and, and of course people like to collect things as well. Cause I know you've kind of got a few things in your, in your collection, but it's, it's one of these things that I think, um, again, these things go through peaks, you know, early adoption and then yeah. early majority and all that sort of stuff. But it'd be interesting to see where, where it all lands. But, um, yeah, it's, so. it's an interesting concept. I think we're still experimenting with it, right? I, I think so. I mean, I can see you have an Oculus in, in the background there, but when when we do have more, and people just use this term metaverse very generically without really <laughs> yeah. understanding what people are talking about. But, you know, having that, you talked before about augmentation, having that kind of augmented reality, that's a thing that is happening. Like that isn't a, oh, people are buying JPEGs of monkeys. Like, you know, the conflating things again. And that will happen at that point. You know, look how much kids are spending. I sound so old. How much kids are spending on Robux or skins in Fortnite, for example? Now they're not NFTs; they don't own those. But right. the 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 world. I mean, I mean, the market opportunity for companies to go into Web three and have digital versions of the things that they have. Like, it just needs to be this mindset shift of people going, "Oh, well, I could just copy and paste that." You could you could redraw the Mona Lisa, couldn't you? Like, it wouldn't be valuable. It's about the scarcity of it, and like yeah. you say so yeah i think that the, 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 here's an interesting angle from perhaps from a security perspective the thing i struggle with it all is there's a decentralized dream there's like this sort of utopian yeah. vision of decentralization the reality is i think at the moment is it's corrupted by the centralized elements the exchanges and the various things around it that have that's where most of the controversies are right you look at the hacks yeah. and, the, and the issues with it it's an awful it's an awful lot of the exchanges that are getting popped or you know people just aren't storing their um keys properly you know so uh, do you think that's do you think that that's going to get fixed anytime soon or is that just going to be a long burning problem it's a it's a great question I, w- I will say on that though i think there are some kind of more traditional kind of news outlets that are quite lazy i think certainly <laughs> some genuinely like some of the incendiary stuff i've read on everything from ftx to just general kind of compromise of crypto wallets uh, yeah is is possibly I would take some of that with, with a pinch of salt. Some, some of it's Web2 stuff that we've already seen, right? When you talk about people having wallets compromised, yes, are they like arcane and like higher likelihood to be compromised? Yeah, but was a website 20 years ago? Yeah, you know, there's that evolution and kind of maturity. The market, I mean, at rapid rates is responding accordingly. Like the way that you now manage cryptographic wallets without boring your listeners and readers and, and, and watchers on this, but try not to. Like having having kind of layered models for that so that your wallet isn't online the entire time, having better controls, better visibility on your wallets that say what this transaction is, education and awareness on what is a smart contract, getting people to not necessarily read an entire like D app, but getting someone to understand the key points. So and a lot of it will get fixed, Oliver, genuinely. I, I think there's a really yeah. interesting sort of piece there, which is the kind of awareness and understanding. Because I think a lot of people yeah, enter the space and they're without being unfair to them, they're a bit clueless, right? They're just investing in something like they're buying a exchange traded fund or something. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, 100%. it's just like, it's not, this isn't just another commodity class. You kind of need to understand a little bit. You need to be quite ed- well-educated. And and I, I hope at some point we'll get to a place where you can very easily find, you know, good guidance for storing passwords or creating secure passwords, right? But where is the good trusted guidance on where to store your keys or how to manage that? That, that that for me feels like, oh, could you trust someone writing about that? Or are they trying to steal your keys? Do you, yeah. you, there's, some, there's some issues there at the moment. There, there are definitely, yeah, yeah. There are some unscrupulous people, definitely. But there are some great people in Web3, people who are focusing almost exclusively on Web3 security, which I would not profess to be doing day in, day out, but do some. Um, 
there's some good content already available. I don't know if you circulate like notes and whatnot, but there's some links that I can provide to some good. No, please do. Yeah, I do. I do add links to these. There. So yeah, do check out the links in the channel. Definitely. The well, remind me because again on GitHub, there's some good stuff there on nice. like you know if you're writing a contract, what to do through to hey you're in Discord. How do you stay safe in Discord when people are trying to scam you every day, ten times a day? So yeah. Awesome. Well, Chris, as I suspected, we've covered a load of ground um, and there's, there's probably scope There's scope for at least one more episode, if not a few, a few more. And maybe... I, I enjoy talking with you, mate, definitely. Maybe, thank you. Maybe um, maybe Web3 is one we could pick up on at, at, at some point because I have a few people in that in that That'll space. So there's, really and, and the great thing about this topic is people are pretty much on one side of the camp. Yeah. There aren't many people that sit in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That That is definitely good. One thing I will say before I go... I'm not calling engineers children, by the way. That's a rubbish, <laughs> that is a rubbish analogy. I was talking more broadly. Otherwise, I will come off this and I'll have lots of Slack messages of what you Well, yeah. no, luckily it's not been broadcast live and that, that may not even make the final. I've already forgotten about it by then. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> and actually, I think, but no, but I think the whole parent's um, child kind of mental model is an important one to use, right? In emotional. Yeah, it is. How, how are you behaving? Are you, are you behaving to someone like a peer or are you, are you parenting them? And I think in security, that's, that, that holds true, right? I think quite often you get people being parented rather than having a peer-to-peer conversation. Definitely. There's, 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 a, there's a blog there, I think. Maybe. Yeah, nice one. Well, look, Chris, thanks very much for your time. I know you're a busy man. Um, we didn't even touch on your crazy fitness regime. So we'll, that'll have to we'll, we'll have to do one. Yeah, check out my Twitter, I suppose, or media. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, remind, remind folks what your Twitter handle is. Uh, Stodds21. Is, okay. We can put it in the in, yeah. In put the it chat. in the show notes as well. All right. It's, well, look, Chris, have a have a great weekend. We're recording on Friday, thanks, and I will almost certainly twist your arm into getting you on, a, on another episode. Hopefully, it won't be as long ne- next time uh, uh, between recordings. Um, great stuff. Well, look, um, everyone, if if you've enjoyed this, do go check out Chris's first episode. There's some great advice in that one. Do subscribe, like all that sort of usual jazz, and Brilliant. I'll see you on the next one. Thanks very much. Great stuff. Thanks, mate. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.